Te da koto te fano o Auckland Unitarians. Te da koto na manahiri. No mai, higher mai. Higher mai ki te ne whare karakia. A te ato. Te da katoa. Te da tato katoa. Welcome to the space made sacred over the last 116 years by Auckland Unitarians. To our guests and visitors, we invite you to come sit by our fire and let us share stories. Let us hear your tales of far-off lands, wander, and we will tell you our travels. Share your experience of the holy with us, worshiper, and we will tell you that which we find divine. Come and stay, lover of leaving. For ours is no caravan of despair, but of hope. We would hear your stories of grief and sorrow as readily as those of joy and laughter. For there is a time and a place and a hearing for all the stories of this world. Stories are the breath and the word of the spirit of life, that power that we name love. Come. For our fire is warm and we have seats for all. Come again and yet again. Come speak to us of what fills your heart, what engages your mind, what resides in your soul. Come also to morning tea. It is our sacrament of hospitality and it won't be complete without you. For my opening words, I want to share with you two poems that capture our theme of the day. The first is familiar to anyone who has watched three marriages at a funeral. W.H. Auden's poem entitled, Funeral Blues. Stop all the clocks. Cut off the telephone. Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos and with muffled drum. Bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. Let aeroplanes circle moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crepe boughs around the white necks of the public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east, and west. My working week, my Sunday rest. My noon, my midnight. My talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can ever come to any good. The second poem is less familiar but it captures the journey through grief that Auden describes so profoundly. It is entitled The Five Stages of Grief by Linda Paston. The night I lost you, someone pointed me towards the five stages of grief. Go that way, they said. It's easy, like learning to climb stairs after the amputation. And so I climbed. Denial was first. I sat down at breakfast, carefully setting the table for two. I passed you the toast. You sat there. I passed you the paper. You hid behind it. Anger seemed more familiar. I burned the toast, snatched the paper, and read the headlines myself but they mentioned your departure 
And so I moved on to bargaining. What could I exchange for you? The silence after storms? My typing fingers? Before I could decide, depression came puffing up, a poor relation, its suitcase tied together with string. In the suitcase were bandages for the eyes and bottles of sleep. I slid all the way down the stairs, feeling nothing. And all the time, hope flashed on and off in defective neon. Hope was a signpost pointing straight in the air. Hope was my uncle's middle name. He died of it. After a year, I am still climbing, though my feet slip on your stone face. The tree line has long since disappeared. Green is the color I have forgotten. But now I see what I am climbing towards, acceptance, written in capital letters, a special headline, acceptance, its name and lights. I struggle on, waving and shouting. Below my whole life spreads its surf, all, all the landscapes I've ever known or dreamed of. Below a fish jumps, the pulse in your neck, Acceptance, I finally reach it. But something is wrong. Grief is a circular staircase. I have lost you. I like the chalice this morning with these words from Kate Walker. We open our hearts to love, yet sometimes find pain. We open our hearts to connection, yet sometimes find loss. We yearn for simplicity, yet sometimes find complexity. May the light and warmth of this flame heal our hearts, find connection, and embrace life in all its simplicity and complexity with love, with trust, with compassion. In adult religious education this year, we're exploring how to face death in order to live. Not surprisingly, we have spent considerable time on the subject of grieving One of the more helpful resources we considered was a lecture entitled Loss, the Litmus Test of a Religious Faith, given in 1985 by John Nichols to a bunch of Unitarians. He begins by telling of a colleague interviewing for a new ministry. The search committee, having read all of his best credentials, had one concern. They said, you seem to speak a great deal about grief. Now, we are a youngish congregation. We have perhaps four or five funerals a year, and we wonder if you have an interest in the younger members of the congregation. In fact, to be perfectly frank, we wonder if you haven't styled yourself a geriatric ministry. Nichols goes on to observe that this perception of the significance of grief is not limited to the young. An older member of my own congregation said to me once, you speak too much about grief. I want to hear something uplifting on Sunday mornings. Why is it necessary to be so depressing? If you feel the same about grief, and you would not be alone. I hope you'll find to your surprise that talking about grief this morning might give you a lift rather than bring you down. You can let me know at morning tea if I succeeded. Like most ministers, I feel most in touch with my colleague when dealing with grief. 
When we share grieving with our people, we are facing the most moving religious issues anyone can confront. I agree with Nichols when he argues that a religion that cannot talk about grief with credibility cannot find credibility on any other subject. Normally, we associate grief with death. Certainly, there is that. I have no idea how many funerals I have conducted. There have been a lot, but I do remember one year where I did 50 of them. As you might imagine, that was an emotionally difficult year. However, if we imagine that we only grieve what a spouse, sibling, parent, child, close friend dies, we're not paying attention. Grief is the experience of sadness which comes with any loss. If it were not for these, the greater losses would be more difficult to bear. The reward I get from preparing for, from preparing for our adult RE sessions is the ample opportunity, opportunity to reflect on loss and its companion grief in my own life. My very first memory in life is the day my father was struck down with polio. I was three. I could still see him trying to help me fly a kite in the front yard and falling down repeatedly. It was a loss I could not fully comprehend and was left scared and confused. From then on, my life was shaped by loss after loss. We moved a lot. From kindergarten through year nine, I went to five schools in three different states. By the time I was 21, my mother determined I had lived in 21 different domiciles. Each was an occasion of loss of friends, security, and a sense of myself and the world. Each required a rebuilding of my life and finding my place. While well, these were small losses compared with those I would experience later, they went a long way in preparing me to grieve the big losses. They didn't make grief any easier, but they gave me hope that I would survive the loss. Looking back, I feel like my life has been painted on a canvas of grief. The canvas shaped colored, altered, and textured my life as surely as an artist's brush. Without loss, my life would look quite different. Different, but not necessarily better. It is, isn't it, isn't that true for all of us? Nichols points out that people grieve when they cl clearly cease to have the protections of childhood. They grieve when they go away from home for the first time. They grieve when they have to give up their first love. They grieve when they suffer a serious illness or injury. They grieve when they leave each stage of life for another. People grieve when they change jobs or homes, when they leave one beloved and comfortable community for, for another. For a teenager, the end of an infatuation or friendship can bring on a grief as profound, as serious as the grief which may follow the death of a grandparent. If we minimize the grief of the young or the old or our own grief, for whatever reason it may occur, then we do not contribute to their strengthening and growing or to our own. The Sufi mystic Rumi invites us to be as a guest house and welcome each new arrival, even if it be a crowd of sorrows. Invite the man, Rumi says, meet them at the door laughing, treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. 
Grief is not a welcome guest at most doors. Grief is the companion of love, to be sure, but a hard companion. In her book, Companion Through the Darkness, Stephanie Erickson muses, grief is a tidal wave that overtakes you, smashes you up into its darkness, where you tumble and crash against unidentifiable surfaces, only to be thrown out on an unknown beach, bruised and reshaped. Others experience it as a tear in the fabric of our accustomed lives that we must eventually attempt to gather the threads of what remains to reweave a new pattern of daily life. Treating, treating each guest honorably, to welcome them, to invite them in, is no simple task. It is hard work perhaps the hardest work we will ever do. As difficult as the path through grief is, it is the only path that exists. It reminds me of the children's story of going on a bear hunt. Remember that story? In the story, the child is faced with a series of obstacles. At each one, the story's refrain is, can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it, got to go through it. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture, invite them in. But an openness to showing hospitality to our sorrows has not always been encouraged by those in the helping professions or even those close to us. Someone else's grief can make us very uncomfortable. Grief used to be called melancholia. It was considered a disease by psychiatrists. The standard text on pastoral counseling that I studied in seminary was Howard Kleinbell's Basic Types of Pastoral Counseling, published in 1966. It considered the subject of grief under the heading Counseling in the Crisis of Bereavement, to which only five pages out of hundreds were devoted. Three years later, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross ushered in a new era in our understanding of grief with her book on death and dying. She opened the floodgates on research and comment on all aspects of grief with her description of its five stages. Fortunately, by the time I went to seminary, I had her work to supplement Clyde Bell's textbook in my study of pastoral counseling. All this research does not suggest loss is a gift, especially when it's the death of a loved one. Far from it. Even when death comes at the end of a long and rewarding life, even when we see it coming, even when we know it's not a tragedy, the loss is stark. Even when my mother died, not knowing who I was after years of dementia, the grief was palpable. From that experience, I could relate to Stephen Dobbin's poem, Prague. The day I learned my wife was dying, I told myself if anyone said, well, she had a good life, I'd punch him in the nose. How much life represents a good life? Maybe 100 years? Which would give us nearly 40 more to visit Oslo and take the train to Vladivostok, learn German to read Thomas Mann in the original even more baseball games, more days at the beach, and the baking of more walnut cakes for family birthdays. How much time is enough time? How much is needed for all those unspent kisses, those slow walks along cobbled streets? Nor does the research say grief can or should be gotten over. 
though people are told to get over their losses. Michael Lee West expressed his feelings in his southern dialect about such messages vividly in American Pie. I was tired of well-meaning folks telling me it was time I got over being heartbroken. When somebody tells you that, a little bell ought to dig in your mind. Some people don't know grief from garlic grits. <laughs> there are some things a body ain't meant to get over. No, I'm not suggesting you wallow in sorrow or let it drag on. No, I'm just saying it never really goes away. A death in the family is like having a pile of rocks dumped in your front yard. Every day you walk out and see them rocks. They're sharp and ugly and heavy. You just learn to live around them the best way you can. Some people plant moss or ivy. Some leave it be. Some folks take the rocks one by one and build a wall. Beyond the research are the reflections of the bereaved. Holly Tangway offers these thoughts in a sermon a year after the death of her husband. Loss connects us to our deepest needs, the needs for shared pleasures, for touch, for love, and for meaning in our lives. Even as we yearn backwards for the treasures we once had, grief reminds us to treasure life now and drink of it deeply. Any new grief also connects us to every other loss we carry. Some of those losses may have been well mourned and stand ready to welcome a new loved one into the company of cherished memories. Others may have left wounds not fully healed by time. The pain of those can be newly intensified. Still others may have been sealed up without healing at all, leaving us unaware of buried suffering that was never comforted. As we struggle to cope with a new tear in the fabric of our accustomed lives, there are perils and opportunities. Some of the time we must just soldier on, cope with settling the estate, paying the bills, mowing the lawn, and caring for others and ourselves as best we can. But if we only soldier on, only stay positive, because that is what our loved ones, what loved one would want, only keep chin up and eyes on the horizon, we will miss the chance to hold and comfort ourselves, the chance to grow through our grief, developing deeper compassion for ourselves and others, renewing our awareness of how sacred each life is, including our own. I have come to understand that in a world that has trouble welcoming sorrows, the church at its best is a beloved community where it is safe to grieve. Safe because we welcome as an honored guest the sorrows at our door. Safe because we will accept that everyone grieves, but each in their own way. Safe because we won't hurry the grieving to finish up. Safe because we will remain present to those living with sorrow, even to our own discomfort. Safe because we know healthy grieving leads to new life, new possibilities. Even if the bereaved can't yet see that far, safe because we know that life gives more than it takes away. 
Amen. For the meditation, I invite you to reflect on Gordon McKee and its words about our ministry in this place in the face of grief. Ministry is all that we do together. Ministry is that quality of being in community that affirms human dignity, beckons forth hidden possibilities, invites us into deeper, more constant, reverent relationships, and carries forward our heritage of hope and liberation. Ministry is what we do together as we celebrate triumphs of our human spirit, miracles of birth and life, wonders of devotion and sacrifice. Ministry is what we do together with one another in terror and torment, in grief, in misery and pain, enabling us in the presence of death to say yes to life. We who minister speak and live the best we know with full knowledge that it's never quite enough and yet are reassured by lostness found, fragments reunited, wounds healed, and joy shared. Ministry is what we all do together. My closing words are by Robert Weston. I will lift up my voice and sing. Whatever may befall me, I will follow the light which kindles song. I will listen to the music arising out of grief and joy alike. I will not deny my voice to the song. For the depth of winter, song like a bud peeping through the dry crust of earth brings back memory, creates and creates anew, and creates anew the hope and anticipation of spring. Out of a world that seems barren of hope, sing to Christ's beauty in the shapes of leafless trees, lifts her eyes to distant mountain peaks, which, even if we don't see even if we see them not, remind us that we are there waiting and still calling to us to come up higher. Out of the destruction of dear hopes, out of the agony of heartbreak, song rises once more to a whisper to, to whisper to us that even this is but the stage setting for a new beginning and that we shall yet take the pieces of our hearts and put them together in a pattern of deeper, truer lights and shades. 
I will lift up my voice on song, for in singing I myself am renewed, and the darkness of night is touched. But the promise of a new dawn, for light shall come again. Go in peace. Thank you.